thanks to the U.S. India Business Council, a place that I know extremely well from my time working here starting back in 1998. And the, uh, the level of participation and the topics uh, have grown tremendously since that time. Now, in the nine years since coming to power, the Modi government has prioritized the manufacturing ecosystem in some pretty significant ways. I think we all know the reasons, and in fact, a lot of these same reasons will resonate well with Americans. We want to create jobs. We want to offset a trade imbalance. And of course, we would add to that factors that uh, became more apparent over time, which is looking at uh, security concerns and looking at the stability of supply chains during COVID. So many reasons that uh, India, as well as the United States, have been looking and focusing at manufacturing supply chains, also a topic and theme that has per, uh, really kind of uh, pervaded the entire uh, conference uh, so far. Uh, India's tools for trying to improve the manufacturing ecosystem, I think, have evolved over time. Uh, we saw some steps towards protectionism uh, early on, of course, driven by the fact that India has one of the largest trade deficits in the world and trying to give time for domestic manufacturing but also a healthy mix of domestic reforms, including a lot of liberalization on foreign direct investment in the early years. And now I'd say uh, kind of a, a, a mix that we see of uh, domestic support with the PLI programs, as well as initiating uh, trade agreements. You know, sometimes when we've got US-India trade talks, I still have the US trade journalists that call me and say, how are we gonna get India more excited about trade deals? And of course my response is, India is actually signing trade deals, whereas the United States is kind of retrenching on trade policy more so. So it's a big difference from what we saw in times past. And I think sometimes not everybody stateside is uh, tracking what's happening in Delhi quite as close as we should be. Now, while the, uh, the World Bank uh, has not necessarily, despite these many years of making India, noted a, a significant uptick in manufacturing and percent of GDP, uh, I think with, uh, with COVID and security supply chain, I think there's new reasons to look at wind in the sails uh, and some announcements by some major technology manufacturers and suppliers to set up shop in India. So it feels that the uh, time for this conversation uh, couldn't be better. So the question is, are we about to see that kind of acceleration in industrial development that we've been waiting for? Uh, we've got some incidents and evidence to show that it might be happening. And what's the role that foreign partners can and must play to try to make this happen? And excited to have such a great uh, series of panelists up here with me. Of course, uh, uh, Dr. Hamani Panda, Joint Secretary for Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade from the Government of India. Uh, Jharkhand IS officer, so we were exchanging stories about Ranchi. If you haven't been to see Tagore Hill and the Rock Garden and things, uh, definitely a must do at some point on one of your future trips. A number of senior roles, both at the central government as well within the state government, including as finance secretary for the state. Uh, my good friend Paul Dyke, who's vice president of global public policy and government affairs from Walmart. Uh, nine years at Walmart, but of course, much longer career working at the nexus of business and policy, including a three year stint in government himself uh, at the Department of Commerce as the deputy assistant secretary for Europe and Eurasia. And last, uh, Guru Bandakar, who's the Global Vice President Supply Chain Management at Carrier. Uh, if you wanna know how to make something and how to send it anywhere in the world, looking at uh, Guru's bio, uh, he's practically done it all, supply chains and trucks, tools and technology, along with other areas. So uh, thanks to this terrific panel, and let's get things started. Uh, I wanna start off, of course, with, uh, with Dr. Pandey, uh, talking about, uh, um, you know, here we sit, uh, a lot happening in the world right now. India is getting some, uh, I think, terrific uh, interest from manufacturers this time. You've got an election around the corner. And everybody always kind of wonders, you know, the year up to an election, uh, is government capable of doing big things? What kind of steps can we, do you think that we can see? Um, and, and are in fact the elections becoming more mutually supportive of development. I think in times past we thought liberalizing the economy, foreign investment was something that was, you know, uh, politically difficult, but how do you see you know this this coming together of India as a supply chain hub and elections mutually supportive, uh, not really relevant anymore? I uh, wonder if you can give us your hot take on a critical topic that everybody's talking about these days. Thank you uh, for that question. That's a difficult question to answer, I would say. But having said that, I think if you look at the journey that we've taken over the past uh, almost a decade, I think it's a continuous journey of reforms across various sectors. So I think the pillars uh, towards uh, improving India's, uh, uh, you know, uh, three phases where we went from imports to import substitution to now uh, export-led growth, I think what we have tried to focus on continuously is improving and strengthening the manufacturing sector, for which uh, there have been various pillars uh, on which the focus has been. One is, of course, uh, continuous reforms, like I said. The other has been a... Uh, uh, 
increasingly liberalized regime in FDI, as you mentioned also. So now, if you look at the data for last year, almost 98% of our FDI came through the automatic route. So it didn't require any government approvals. It just came right into the country. And uh, over the last year, which is not that far away from elections, I think, uh, we also saw an increasingly liberali increasing liberalization in whether it was insurance, which was always a very difficult field, um, then uh, telecom, uh, railways, broadcasting, as well as in aviation. So um, it's not to say that difficult decisions are not getting taken. They are getting taken. And uh, uh, in uh, FDI, uh, like I said, and these all these steps have helped. It's been an incremental change, and uh, in terms of how we've seen growth in this, uh, in terms of numbers, if you look at FDI, it's uh, last year's FDI is almost 82% of the total FDI that we were receiving in uh, 2014. So that's a big jump uh, that we are seeing. Almost 62% of the total FDI which came in the uh, past uh, few years has come within this time set. So uh, these are big numbers that we're talking about, and I think uh, they repose a faith in the continuous liberalization that has taken place. The other um, major reform pillar which has happened is ease of doing business, as we were talking about earlier, and uh, increasingly reducing the uh, compliance burdens. Almost 39,000 regulatory practices have been revised, reformed, uh, removed, and increasing uh, decriminalization that has taken place uh, across various sectors. So laws have been reformed, laws have been junked also. So uh, that is one uh, area that we are moving forward in. And uh, I know you said, uh, you know, there has not been that uptick in GDP that we see as a result of the ease of doing business. But if you look at how we have performed across various sectors um, in each of these, there has been a big jump in terms of position. I don't think if you look at it like that, in just in terms of simplification of processes and easier uh, uh, application processes, I think that has been very helpful for everyone. Um, in terms of uh, ensuring that people have it easier you know, the application process, the tracking of the applications, the approval process has become easier. The national single window system is in place, uh, which is now accommodating 31 ministries, as well as almost 29 states. So those are the kind of integrations. There are some uh, loops and gaps which are there, and it's a work in progress, but is increasingly getting uh, stronger and stronger day by day. And um, as of the last count that I had, uh, about a lakh, 50,000 approvals have come through that single window system. So those are big numbers that we're talking about, and they uh, show um, improving uh, systems uh, uh, per se. Then in terms of um, how we are attracting and ensuring that you know India becomes a manufacturing hub, I think one of the concerns with India had always been about infrastructure and the weak infrastructure. I think that has been... Uh, um, slowly uh, becoming stronger and stronger with uh, whether it is the Bharat Mala project where we are, are doing an astounding 37 kilometers uh, per day or the Sagar Mala project uh, where uh, port modernization is taking place or Udan where more and more air routes are taking, uh, you know, um, uh, coming on as well as new airports, almost doubling our capacity uh, and new airports have come up. And uh, uh, railways, uh, the laying of new railway lines have, has quintupled. So uh, those are the numbers that we are looking at. And uh, there's a huge focus on this with the national infrastructure pipeline, the national monetization pipeline, as well as with the PM Gati Shakti program that looks at uh, improving the logistics. And uh, with specific targets that we reduce uh, the logistic expenditure to GDP below 10%. So those are the numbers that we are looking at. And I don't think, think that we are seeing any slowdown in terms of reforms. I'm uh, glad you said that. I mean, we've seen sometimes, uh, looking at a lot of colleagues from the India uh, battles in times past, uh, the, the, the previous government's willing to sever uh, ties with one of the political parties in 2008. Uh, just a year ahead of the election for, for trying to secure the U.S.-India Civilian Nuclear Agreement. So you do hear a lot. Governments tend to be a little bit more risk-averse ahead of elections. But actually, if you look back at history, that is certainly not always the case. So hopefully some big things to come. Thank you for that. Well, uh, Make in India is nice, but of course, you also need uh, people to buy the stuff that gets made. And uh, Paul, I've heard Walmart has a bit of a checkbook sometimes for doing some, uh, some purchases around the world. You, your firm has been discussing increasing sourcing from India, which you know, generally, uh, of course, that's uh, 
uh, something that isn't always necessarily uh, driven on the table. But what are the categories that you see and what's sort of driving this renewed interest or this, this new interest from Walmart uh, to look at India as a major sourcing destination? Yeah, thanks, Rick. And um, yeah, we do buy a lot of stuff. Our whole business model collapses if we can't get a lot of good quality goods at affordable prices for our, our customers. That's the DNA of Walmart. And there's really a number of, of factors that are emerging together that really uh, make India such an important part of our sourcing right now. Rick, you started with it, which is pointing out the obvious, which is you know, the last few years, we don't need to spend any time on it, pandemic wars, you know, uh, domestic politics in different countries, geopolitics have, you know, stressed the, su the supply chain, and the supply chain hasn't been um, as healthy as it, as it should be, so we need a resilient supply chain in order, order to operate our business. Right now, two-thirds of what we sell in the U.S., we source here in the U.S. It's either manufactured, produced here in the U.S., um, but that remaining third that we source uh, internationally, that still represents, you know, tens and tens of billions of dollars um, of, of products. And so, um, you know, we have a big effort underway within the company of making sure we have the most resilient supply chain um, that we can have. So one, just a, a big business Im imperative uh, there. As we're looking at those, you know, markets that are gonna uh, be part of that resilient supply chain, we look for markets where we can have enough scale, um, expertise, and markets that we know. And so that's you know, kind of the second one is, you know, the first, any part of our business, Walmart's business in India was 25 plus years ago, was sourcing from Tirupur. Um, and that was before we did anything else in India. So we've been sourcing out of India for 25 years, and it's a, you know, not insignificant uh, part of our global supply chain. Uh, you know, right now. Um, so there's, you know, we've got some experience there. Um, third, that was the first part of our business, but now we have such a much bigger uh, business in India. India is now um, really, you know, it's not our biggest market outside the U.S., but it is really our top priority growth market um, outside the U.S. In 2018, we acquired e-commerce marketplace Flipkart and the digital uh, payments and financial uh, services company PhonePay, which are uh, really good uh, local businesses growing rapidly. We need a ecosystem of suppliers, sellers for our marketplace. Um, we have a Walmart, our U.S. marketplace, so if you, you know, shopped here on our marketplace, we're onboarding Indian sellers onto that. So. Um, because of our business there, we really want to build up this ecosystem of, of sellers. And then finally, uh, you know, we have all this, you know, self-interest that I've just talked about. It's great that it's also such a priority to the, to the government. And, um, you know, a lot has to happen to build this right ecosystem so, um, you know, so we can um, accomplish uh, what we hope to accomplish with, with sourcing and exporting from India um, and having the, the government uh, make, make in India such a top priority in the reforms and the, the things they're doing. All these things combined give us the, the confidence that a couple of years ago, which we've not done anywhere else um, before or since, has made a, you know, a public commitment to triple our sourcing from India by 2027 to $10 billion per year by, by 2027. So um, lastly, just to answer the second part of your question, Rick, that means you know, traditionally in the 25 years that I've talked about, you know, we've developed some really good supplier relationships, Trident, Wellspun, and other great Indian companies for, you know, textiles, home goods. To reach 10 billion and, and go beyond that, we've got to expand the category. So, you know, we're looking at, um, and not only looking at, we've been sourcing now seafood, uh, shoes. This Christmas, if you're in some Walmarts, you'll, be, you'll buy bicycles from your children uh, for the first time that are made in India. Um, you know, new food categories, toys is a growing category and see a huge opportunity um, in toys. So really are gonna be able to expand the categories from where we've traditionally sourced into a lot of new ones. That's great, that's great. Um, 
Uh, Guru has a bit of a time constraint too, since his flight's coming up in a little bit. So if with everybody's indulgence, I might throw him a couple of questions in a row so we can grab as much of his knowledge uh, before, he has to, uh, before he has to jump off the stage. Uh, we've talked a lot about ecosystem supply chain. Um, at the end of the day, too, a firm like Carrier that has to, uh, that has to build stuff needs that supplier network. Uh, how, how, can you tell us a little bit about what you see in India right now for being able to manufacture there, find the suppliers, do you look locally, do you look internationally? What, what sort of things do you see changing that make it a, a different place to do business than what you've seen in the past? Thanks, Guru. Thank you. No, thanks for that question. Um, so I think last night, Ambassador Kashyap, you mentioned four Ps, and that's the framework that Eric Garcetti is using as he's hitting the ground running. I thought of that as like three Ps from my perspective, and that's, you know, first is policy. I think the, the work that the government of India has done, whether it's PLI schemes or just various other things that are available that just weren't available a few years ago, that's been very, very helpful. So the policy is there, the framework is there. Um, so the second one is the process, right? So the, the, while the policy is there, accessing that policy has been a challenge for us. It's, you know, it's things like single window clearances and going and understanding where to go for what, not only at the federal or the union level, but also at the state level has been a challenge. Just as an example, uh, I was talking to Joint Secretary just a few minutes ago, and she said, the industry we're in, which is HVAC refrigeration, was part of the PLI scheme. And you know, I, who have been very involved in this, have been trying to get access to this PLI scheme for last at least a year, and I just learned that that was the, the industry was part of the PLI scheme. So just knowledge and simplicity of process is something that can be improved on. And then finally, I think of it as production systems, and that's the supplier ecosystem. You talked about it earlier. Uh, that's still in its infancy from our perspective. Our, me being a industrial, diversified industrial company who has lower volume, high complexity, high mix of products. And when it comes to things like machining and casting and electronics and electrical harnesses and you know, things, plastic injection molding, those types of industries, while they may be available for somebody like an auto industry or a white good industry, for an industrial company like us, those suppliers are hard to come by. And mostly because the tier two, tier three supply raw material and the input is not that easily available in India. So we find where we have a lot of suppliers in India where we have to bring in uh, products, export the products from Southeast Asia into India to be able to then uh, transform that before we export it out of India. So that's kind of where we see. Uh, but with that being said, uh, un, you know, not unlike Walmart, our goal is also is at least triple or more our sourcing from India. Uh, we think of India as a great destination, a lot of capability, uh, both from an export perspective, but of course, uh, HVAC industry is growing rapidly in India, and whether it's because of Make in India, but also global warming and sustainability, which we think is a macro tailwind for our industry. Thanks, Guru. And I got one, one critical follow-up question for you, and I'm going to ask a very similar one, too, to uh, Dr. Pandey, which is uh, looking at, uh, of course, you're not, you're not investing in India. You're investing in states. And uh, for those in this room and those that are, know some of the work that uh, the council has done over the years, you know, state governments at the end of the day have such a critical role in defining the business agenda. So we've talked a lot about central government policies, but for you as an investor, what are some things that you see in your engagement with state governments that uh, you know, really become that kind of pull that you see from state governments? Yeah, I think, so the state government policies are very diverse based on the state, of course, right? So what we found based on our experience is the states that where we would like to go, which are the southern states where the industrial supply base and the ecosystem is much more mature, those are, at least in our experience, relatively less willing to work with us in terms of investment profile, right? At least they are harder for us to access. And maybe we're not asking the right questions and talking to the right people, but that's been the case. Whereas the states that are more inland and hence distant away from the port and the infrastructure uh, are much more willing and much more uh, wanting to build their industrial ecosystems. So again, it goes back to like, how do we create an ecosystem not only within the each, each states, but cross states to kind of you know be a synergistic for a industrial company like us. 
Oh, thanks, Guru. And I know you got a role, so whenever you have to head out. Uh, uh, Dr. Pandit, let me, let me follow up on that. Of course, uh, the Modi government comes in, competitive cooperative federalism, ranking states. I mean, there's so much that's been happening. How do you look at it from your perch in Delhi, uh, and, and especially having worked in a state government, on that relationship between the center and states? What are things that you do together to try to become that ecosystem that, that manufacturers look at? What are some tools the center has to try to challenge states or work with states? So I love your perspective on how to get states engaged in this whole process and what you do. Yeah. Um, I think increasingly uh, states are becoming uh, very, very conscious of the fact that they need to invite in more investment. And uh, to supplement what Guru said earlier, I think if you look at policies, not only in southern states, but also look at policies uh, in land-bound states or uh, towards the uh, northeast, the policies are very, very aggressive in terms of offering incentives uh, for capital uh, expenditure reimbursements or electricity duty reimbursements, even land uh, registration dues uh, reimbursements. In some cases, uh, uh, where labor costs have also been reimbursed to some extent. So. Uh, Apart from these kind of incentives, there are various other policy incentives which have been given um, to industries across states. And um, also, Government of India has come up uh, with the Industrialized Land Bank Database. Uh, so about um, almost about 3,500 industrial uh, uh, states have got digitized. So wherever you are sitting across the world, you can actually locate a plot of land. So I think that really helps. Industry will decide where it has to go. You know, if Guru is to look at a port location, uh, he will go towards uh, states which have ports uh, with them. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, we have digitized our land banks. Uh, and coming back to your state rankings, I think that was an exercise which was very, very important. Because uh, this was something uh, states were not re really looking at that competitively. But now there's a lot of competition between states. And initially, the ease of doing rankings was based on just the just Delhi and Mumbai uh, parameters. But now it's uh, the BRAP, the Business Reform Action Plan, that looks at all states. And coming back again to uh, what Guru said about uh, the national single window, like I said earlier, it needs to become stronger and stronger. And as more and more uh, states and uh, ministries get plugged in, it will become stronger. More and more applications and approvals will go through that same process. And about 29 states are already plugged into that system. So we are trying to create a seamless system which helps uh, things to move forward. That's great. That's great. Uh, Paul, I wonder if you can elaborate a bit more. I've heard you talk about before this ecosystem for success. Uh, you need all these things to be working very well. You've got countries around the world that are knocking on your door trying to get you excited and interested about what they have to offer. What does the ecosystem of success look like that, that comes together in a package that gets Walmart excited? Um, you can share a bit on that. Yeah, it's, great. it's a great question because we, you know, we, we can we talk about you know, aspirations for $10 billion and things like that. That was not a... That was not a number that we picked because it was a you know a pretty number. There's a lot of uh, you know a lot that that went into that. And as we were doing that exercise, you know we realized with existing supplier base, with existing um, you know even our own infrastructure, we weren't going to meet that. Okay, and we can't rely. You know, there's. Everybody plays a role in that. We play a huge role in that, not just in purchasing goods, but in helping build that ecosystem. So what it looks like is big suppliers. So either whether it's existing suppliers that we already work with or helping develop new suppliers in big categories. It's small suppliers. It's MSMEs. And we can't ask a, you know, an MSME in India to, you know, even with the best product, just to be able to access a, a global supply chain. We've got to help with that. And so, you know, one area we're investing a lot in is helping build that ecosystem. So whether it's, you know, different supplier development programs. So, you know, one example that we're, that we're really proud of is um, what we call the Vridi Supplier Development Program. It's a, a few years old now. We, we launched it right, literally uh, right before the pandemic. Um, and we had envisioned it as, a supplier development program, in-person centers, and then the pandemic hit, which in that regard made it a much better program because now it's a, a hybrid uh, virtual in-center program. But training tens of thousands of MSMEs, 
you know, ac across the range to give them the skills they need to be able to access supply chains, whether it's our supply chains or others, whether it's Indian domestic or, or global. Um, uh, Flipkart, our e-commerce marketplace, has a supplier development program called Smart, which is targeted just at sellers for their marketplace. So a whole lot of, and then again, we're, we're doing, you know, really of all sizes, we know that it's got to be a diverse supply chain, so that means women-owned businesses, um, you know, uh, just really, really uh, uh, diverse across a lot of different um, areas. Um, Walmart Foundation is investing a lot in farmers and, and uh, helping small farmers reach, uh, reach the supply chain. So there's a su supplier development part of it. And then there's the, you know, we don't manufacture, but where we can play a role is bringing the different partners together. So, you know, one that I, I've mentioned um, earlier, which is toys, which we're excited about just because it's such a, a big category for us, um, where we see real opportunities, where we can bring, um, you know, different partners together to help create, you know, a much bigger, um, you know, sector of, uh, for export for, for India. So, um, you know, and then the, the last piece of that that I would say is, is policy. And again, that's where um, we've been doing a number of different things um, with the government, um, you know, small sessions with sector specific areas, um, you know, different things to really dig in. You know what are the um, you know what are the the policy needs that'll really unlock an even greater acceleration um, of exports and you know we feel really good about all of that. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of work. Um, you know I said earlier you know we're, we're going to we're going to hit that 10 billion. The question is and I won't say a number. I'll, people will you know get mad at me uh, back home whoever's watching. But um, aspirations are to, to, to blow through that number and, and be given much bigger numbers a few years from now. Well, uh, Guru is still here, so I'm going to throw one more over to him, and it can be a really quick answer if you want. But sometimes in an evening like last night at this beautiful art gallery over at Patyalapeg, some of the old India wonks will sit around and say, is a trade deal around the corner? But I wonder, taking a step back, for you who's been involved in manufacturing supply chains, how significant is it to have trade agreements between countries when you think about places to source, or is it more important to get all the mechanics right on access to electricity and land and things like that? So just wonder if you could put into context. And, and you know, Paul, I might ask you kind of the same thing as well. Um, trade deals, tier one, big deal, must have, nice to have, or everything else has to happen right, and then it's kind of icing on the cake. I would think of trade deal as an icing on a cake, as a supply chain person, for again, from an industrial perspective. Uh, it's, it's more important to get the cost competitiveness right and the labor availability and the supply chain ecosystem and the port access and the agility of the supply chain and the resiliency. If we get all of those things right, then of course it is very imperative that we have a good trade framework so we don't have you know, a lot of uh, co cost and also waste in the system in terms of trade and tariffs and those things. So it's important, but it's not the the original the necessary condition of the initial uh, supply chain development. So Apollo, again, sorry I have to leave, but yeah. thank you and thanks for the great panel. Thanks, Guru. Yeah, yeah uh, same. I mean, we're I, I, we consider ourselves the uh, you know the biggest champions of of, of free trade, and there's no. Uh, you know, there, there's no free trade, open market uh, uh, deal. We don't like. Having said that, it's you know, it's the overall, you know, environment and are the are the pieces in place. Obviously, we, um, yeah, I mean, we we, we support uh, uh, you know free trade, whatever that whatever that looks like, whether it's big or small. But the, the important thing is a you know what the policy environment that allows for you know free movement of goods. Yeah. Dr. Pandey, it's come up already, uh, the PLI program, uh, Guru mentioned it. Um, obviously, this has really been a game changer, a lot of interest, excitement, foreign companies as well as domestic applying, a lot of money being rolled out for this. Uh, it's still relatively early, but can you point to uh, some of the factors that you see already or some of the things you're going to be looking for as to the relative success uh, and areas where the program might need to be improved and polished over time? 
So in terms of uh, PLI uh, scheme, which is a productivity linked uh, scheme, and uh, I think uh, that has been a game changer for the various sectors. 14 sectors are currently covered under the scheme. And I think this scheme has also spawned off a lot of variants across various countries. <laughs> so I think to that extent, it's uh, very credible. And as I, I agree with you, it's early days uh, to really talk about the success of a scheme. But uh, where it has done exceptionally well is uh, the Apple story. And I don't need to repeat that. You all know it very well. I think the kind of value additions that have happened uh, in a short span of time is 20%. Uh, which is a phenomenal considering that if we looked at the China numbers, it's taken them a really almost more than 25 years to go to 49%. And Vietnam has taken a slightly lesser time to go to about 18 to 20%. And this scheme has just been launched and uh, with Apple uh, taking uh, you know, one of the first strides uh, towards implementing it. So 20% value addition in India looks uh, very good to us. We are hoping, uh, and um, in terms of uh, mobiles, I think India, uh, the total domestic consumption of mobiles in India, we are only uh, importing 0.08%. The rest is all India manufactured, so it's it's uh, it's good numbers that we're looking at, and we're hoping to see those. Also, because they had a head start, we have these numbers in place. But the other sectors where we are really looking forward to how this pans out um, is renewable energy, solar panels. Uh, so we have very aggressive targets uh, to meet the COP uh, requirements. We've overarched them, but we would uh, like to you know overreach them uh, further by 2030. Also looking at green hydrogen uh, and uh, food processing. I think that's a very important uh, area for us because uh, a very minuscule amount of food that is produced in India is processed. So this is a sector that has a huge potential and uh, we really hope that the PLI schemes will uh, work uh, in this towards not only uh, producing and saving, saving more and more food, less and less food going towards wastage, uh, but also ensure that uh, these uh, companies would become global champions and lead the export uh, image. You know, with a lot of these programs, too, uh, Dr. Pandey, and, and kind of hitting on the last topic on trade deals, India signed two of them, many others under negotiation. You've got PLI programs. Um, you know, ultimately, these things have to work together. What, what does coordination look like? It's a little bit of a technical in the weeds conversation, I think, but for a lot of people around this room that you know, they, they, they meet with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy talking about solar, but then your office has actually got a lot of the programs to make solar manufacturing uh, grow and move. What does coordination look like? Uh, how do you make sure that the things that you're aiming for PLI, that the ministry, the line ministries in those areas are on board as well? So I just wonder if you can give us a little bit of insight and because uh, uh, not, not everybody understands the process that closely. Thank you. Um, you know, we are a coordinating department. So uh, we ensure that uh, we make it easy for industries to come in and um, hopefully carry those dialogues and conversations forward and finally put in the money where the mouth is. So um, the PLI is actually implemented by various uh, departments. And the, um, f um, so, it's, so for example, pharma has two for medical devices and for um, pharmaceuticals per se. That will go through the pharma department only. That will not be managed by our department. Our department itself has PLIs for the leather and for the foot, footwear sector. So different ministries different, are dealing with different PLIs, but our role is in coordination and uh, also uh, ensuring that all the project development cells across various ministries, there are 29 project development cells, um, they are running and uh, you know, working closely uh, with each of these sectors so that uh, there are no hiccups in the applications uh, in terms of processing. More than 650 applications have been processed in PLI. So those are big numbers that we are looking at. And uh, uh, I think, uh, I was talking to Guru yesterday, and um, unfortunately, um, they missed the deadline. And uh, uh, for refrigeration, uh, that window has closed for them right now. But uh, I think uh, those things can happen in terms of you know gaps in our understanding, gaps in uh, even knowing about uh, whether the scheme exists or not. So I think that is one sector where we need to have the dialogue becoming even more robust. That. Uh, uh, these kind of informations, which are very massive, uh, themselves are not missed, or the uh, indications are not missed by anyone. So uh, I think uh, that is where we uh, look at uh, PLIs going forward. Uh, 
to hoping to really, uh, you know, get the momentum for an export-led growth. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, Paul, I, I might come back to you uh, hitting uh, on something you brought up before, but also the subnational angle. Uh, Walmart announces uh, sourcing uh, goals. Um, at the same time, you have programs to work with suppliers, as you mentioned, like Vridi, uh, all this kind of coming together. State governments. Do you find that when you announce these programs, when you announce sourcing, uh, most state governments come running to you, looking to partner and looking to take advantage? Do you have to go after them? Uh, how, how aware are state governments generally uh, when you announce things of this significance, uh, do, do you find? Yeah, fa fairly aware and, and very interested. <laughs> so, um, yes. And, and, you know, obviously, uh, given India's size and diversity, as, as we talk about, you know, different categories, different sectors. Obviously, some states are, um, uh, you know, leaders in, in, in different areas. So for us, it's it's super important as well that we're, um, you know, looking at, at a strategy that's, you know, yes, uh, India commitment, but, um, you know, looking at different areas. And that means with some of the training programs we're, we're talking about that we're training people for the right you know, for the right sectors and for the right, you know, opportunities um, that we have. So huge, uh, uh, you know, states play a, a huge part in that. And then again, thinking about our domestic Indian business, Flipkart and PhonePay, uh, you know, there's not a piece of India that we don't, you know, touch. Flipkart delivers to, you know, I think it's just about every pin code in, in India now, which means having a seller base that's um, across states and across communities, literally in every part of the country. I'm ready to go on that supplier visit to the Andaman Nicobar Islands with you if we yeah. want to go check <laughs> out good. and see, see what things look like on the <laughs> islands there. Um, you know, Paul, I, let me hit on that point too. You've got these two huge businesses there, you know, sourcing and, and Flipkart phone pay. Flipkart, you're selling products all around. Um, you're coming across probably some suppliers there, but I wonder if you can talk about the relationship between the two. Like, is Flipkart ended up driving uh, new potential suppliers there, or do you try to keep those two parts of the business as, as separate as they can for various reasons? Yeah, I mean, they are separate businesses, but look, if, if, there's, if we have a supplier who can sell on the Flipkart marketplace, who can sell on the Walmart U.S. marketplace, and can export to a Walmart super center in Mexico, fantastic. So, you know, while they are very different businesses um, and some suppliers are gonna, you know, maybe just do, do one or the other, but, um, you know, kind of the, the rising tide lifts all boats. And, and so um, in, in that sense, they're, they're very much, uh, uh, can be very similar. Yeah, no, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well. You know, as as I think about you know some of the some of the learnings that we've uh, we've had from this discussion so far, uh, we obviously have a huge visit coming up next week, and uh, you know it, it seems that a lot of the discussion about what's going to happen for commercial integration next week is going to be focused a lot on on strategic security related uh, areas, um, and, and I wonder you know Dr. Pandey too when when we talk about the big summits that happen like next week's and the fact that the two governments are going to be talking about. Manufacturing and integration, sure, but more in areas that are security oriented. How do you balance this between, you know, the 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 need I think to do a lot of basic manufacturing, the kind of things that you know Paul's talking about sourcing on on home goods and basic supplies, versus the security need to start being self reliant in, in defense and things like that. Uh, big big enough country where you can do all of it at once. Do you have to prioritize a little bit between security-related manufacturing or, or, or general manufacturing? I wonder if you can speak a bit to that, since uh, that's going to be hot on the agenda next week, for sure. Yeah, yeah I think <laughs> uh, we are hoping to uh, have some big announcements on that and a lot of expectations around the visit built on that. Uh, but like I said, there were 14 sectors identified you know, and all sunrise fact sectors. Uh, so basically, our focus is not only on defense, those deals will go through in any case. Mm. That will happen in any case. But what we are looking at is uh, ensuring that manufacturing gets a big fillip. And uh, we've seen that our uh, manufacturing FDI, and that's been encouraged right through, uh, has had a steady rise despite uh, fall in some other sectors. Uh, manufacturing has never tripped on that. So right now, we've seen uh, the number of people who have uh, been added to the manufacturing sector has also grown. We are up to 52 million. 
So uh, those are good numbers that we are looking at, and we hope to have more and more uh, white goods or uh, manufacturing in uh, solar uh, panels and uh, food processing uh, to increase more and more uh, manufacturing and people entering into the manufacturing market. Yeah. That's, that's a good thought. Well, we're just at the, uh, the end of uh, our panel discussion here. Uh, I certainly have walked away with a few critical items. Of course, uh, we all know uh, a state strategy is just as important as a national strategy. Uh, that ecosystem is improving. Uh, firms have a role to play to actually strengthen, not just sit back passively and, uh, and watch it kind of grow and evolve. Uh, there's space to kind of balance, you know, both security as well as uh, non-security related manufacturing. Uh, but I think most importantly, uh, for those of you that are thinking about becoming a, a startup or entrepreneur yourself, uh, take heed at the areas that Paul was talking about, Walmart increasing their sourcing. Uh, take heed of carriers' interest in finding some of those suppliers for the products that they're going to begin producing and uh, jump in those areas soon, and you might be the next, uh, the next unicorn in India. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.